It's fascinating how many different opinions of this man there are, how he can generate, even in his own day, even before before the events of 1483, before he becomes Richard III, he is loved and he is hated, he makes decisions that are popular and unpopular. That was Chris Skidmore talking about Richard III. It's like at the root of civilization. You can't have a civilization unless you've found a way of dealing with your rubbish. And that was Pamela Hart Sean discussing rubbish disposal in Tudor society. Hello and welcome to the History Extra podcast. My name is Rob Attar and I'm the editor of BBC History magazine, which is Britain's best-selling history magazine. It's available in all good news agents, or you can take out a subscription from anywhere in the world. Head to historyextra.com forward slash subscribe for the latest subscription offers. And we have many digital editions, including for the iPad, iPhone, Kindle, Kindle Fire, Google Play and Zinio. For details of these, visit historyextra.com forward slash digital. Richard III has been one of the biggest history news stories of the past couple of years, with the discovery of his skeleton and the dispute about where he should be buried. But has all this focus on his death taken us too far away from an analysis of his life? One person who is seeking to change that is the historian and Conservative MP Chris Skidmore, who is currently researching a new biography of the King to be published next year. Chris came along to our studio a couple of weeks ago to tell us how his findings might change our understanding of Richard. Richard III has clearly been all over the news for the last few months and, and even years, but how much do you think we really know about Richard III the King? Well, as you say, Richard III, uh, the only king who I think has got two societies after his name, the Richard III Foundation, the Richard III Society, and you'd think there'd be an enormous amount of scrutiny of Richard's life. Um, but one of the things I've been determined to do when writing a biography of the king is to go back to the original manuscript sources, mainly in the National Archives at Kew. And a lot of these sources, and I'm quite evangelical about this, you know, they still remain uncatalogued, unprinted. You simply have to leave manuscript by manuscript through these documents. So I do believe there's a lot of stuff still to be found out, particularly small details about the king's life. Uh, obviously everyone focuses on princes in the tower, um, the sort of traditional arguments about Richard, was he sort of a hunchback or not. But I, my view of this is that it takes away from our understanding, or we could have a, a better understanding of who Richard III actually was, a man of his time, a man from the 15th century. So I'm determined to sort of not lay those arguments aside, those debates, but to get back to the original sources and, and, and sort of almost peel back sort of the layers of historiography, the layers of various different readings of Richard III. So, you know, whenever someone asks me about Richard III, the first thing they say is, is he a good king or a bad king? And it's, it's far more complex than that, but the, the starting point has to be to go back to these original manuscripts, of which there will be more documents than there are historians to go through them. And actually, okay, on that question of whether he's a good or bad king, I mean, that's a simplistic reading of it, but I think most people, aside from his supporters, would view him as a bad king, probably because of the story of the Prince of the Tower and maybe the Tudor story afterwards. I mean, do you think that he has been, his reign has been maligned by perhaps how it ended and by what happened with the Prince of the Tower? I think the problem with Richard III, it reigns so short, two years and two months, that you can't really judge it on its own merits in terms of what Richard achieved as, as a medieval king. Almost as he was just get, getting going, the, the reign sort of collapsed. But anyone who is a supporter of Richard III has to sort of answer the question of why did so many people defect from supporting him? Why did so many people in the South particularly decide to go over to Brittany and support Henry Tudor? Why, by the end of his reign, did Richard have to stand up in the Guildhall and proclaim publicly that he wasn't interested in marrying his niece, Elizabeth of York. There are all these rumours circulating, and I'm not saying that there's no smoke without fire, but Richard himself wasn't strong enough as a king to, to quench these. And um, I think that's a real problem, a structural problem within the kingship. And some of the documents I've been go going through in the National Archives are really fascinating because... 
for me, looking at Richard III is not just about his personality. It's about his, his strength and the, the power of his kingship. And what you see are documents of people actually just refusing to obey his commandments. And he writes other letters to various bailiffs, one down in, in Pensney in, in Sussex. And they simply refuse to come in, into his presence. And I think that in itself demonstrates that at a low level, if people are even refusing to obey the king, that there was a real crisis of, of loyalty at the heart of Richard's kingship. Do you think that's because people didn't feel that he was a legitimate king or was it because some things in he himself that he didn't project this aura of authority he needed to? Well, on the question of legitimacy, I'm always fascinated how there's no real outcry, no real sources around what happened to Edward V. It, it seems that people do buy into this notion that Edward V is the bastard king. Edward, later, Edward V, um, yeah, Lord Bastard, as he's also known. That may be because people accept Richard's argument that Edward IV was married before he married his queen, um, Elizabeth Woodville, which was obviously would then delicious to make the, the prince in the tower, Edward V. But at the same time, I sort of feel that there's something deeper that goes on, whether it's to do with what happens to Edward V and his brother Richard, whether people accept they're illegitimate but can't accept a king who authorises their deaths, or whether it's simply because Richard favours his northern supporters, creating this huge imbalance. It does feel that after 1484, that final year, Richard is expecting Henry Tudor to, to invade and have this sort of final lasting battle. But Richard at the same time is incredibly unlucky. And I think that's also, we, we're trying to get into the mind of the king himself. He loses his only son of heir, um, Edward of Middleham, in April 1484, and then his wife, Anne Neville, dies in March 1485. And, and part of me feels that actually a lot of the remaining residual laws to Richard III comes from that Neville connection. And Neville, she was the daughter of the Earl of Warwick, and it was the sort of that noble connection that really gave Richard his power to be able to seize the throne in the first place. And once that's gone... Why do people want to support Richard? Those two deaths must have shaken him quite a lot. Do, do we see the impact of that in his own behaviour? Yeah, the, the first death of his son, Edward of Middleham, there's a really touching passage in the, what's called the Crowling Chronicle, of where, the, and it's probably you know, an observer, and Richard's up at Nottingham Castle, and he spends a lot of time up north as well, which is very interesting. Most kings rarely ever leave the confines of Westminster and Windsor. Richard actually decides to place himself quite up north in the Midlands. He's at Nottingham Castle, and the chronicle t chronicler talks about how the king and the queen are out of their minds with grief. And then when his wife dies... A couple of the manuscripts I've looked at, he, he talks about my, mo my most beloved consort, the dear Queen. I don't think that there was this popular rumour that somehow he was planning on poisoning and his Queen in favour of marrying his niece Elizabeth York is, is true, it's not. Uh, Richard loved his wife, but at the same time, how he deals with her death is fascinating because at the same time as Anne is, is being buried, Richard goes off hawking and he's, we've got sort of little payments towards his hawks and he sends off people into Wales, into France to order some more hawks for him. So you can almost get this picture of a king trying to sort of put this sort of grief out of his mind by going off and, and hawking. So do you think that says something about his idea of kingship, that he feels it has to be very detached from who he is as a person? It's... Really interesting question, because this it's a question which was faced through every discussion of all medieval kings, right up to Henry VIII. To what extent Richard is thinking independently as Richard, a person, or is he just thinking in terms of his responsibilities as a king? So when you look at some of the, his letters that he writes, and there's said, a lot of these letters unpublished in the National Archives, he talks about his concern for the commonwealth, for the poor man, the poor woman, and... The Ricardians, those people who you know, think Richard's reputation needs to be re rehabilitated, have specifically picked up on Richard's concern for the welfare of the poor. But the thing is, these documents exist for Edward IV, they exist for Henry VI. It's sort of a, a topos, it's a language that's used by every single king. So it's really difficult to try and break apart Richard the King from Richard the Person. Almost the only way we can do this is by reflecting also then back on his earlier life before he was king. And, and that's kind of interesting too, that subject. I mean, how does he compare to other medieval kings from, from what you studied of him? Is he an unusual king or is he actually fairly typical, for, albeit for his brief reign? 
Historians have focused on Richard's Parliament, where he starts to introduce sort of legislation banning what are called benevolences, these gifts that people are, they're not gifts at all, people are forced to make them um, to the king to help him go off and wage war, and Richard decides to ban them. And that's seen as a sort of a new direction in terms of away from his brother's reign, where these were very popular. But the attitude towards the poor, he almost sets up what's called a, a court of requests, where he allows poor people to have their cases heard. That seems to be possibly a new innovation. But at the same time, Richard's concern for justice, for instance, he brings sort of his lawyers together and asks them questions about various different cases. He seems to have a real interest in justice, and justice being one of the key planks on which a medieval king must operate to allow justice for all. It seems very similar to what Edward IV does. So far too often, I think, we've singled out little episodes and said, oh, well, actually, you know, Richard was interested in justice, he was interested in the welfare of the poor. It's not much different from, I think, what goes on before. The only thing I'd say about Richard III is that he tends to make a real outward display of, of these moments. And I say that because his proclamations are different from proclamations that go before from kings. And in particular, Richard's really obsessed with sexual morality. One of his proclamations against the, the rebels, the Buckingham's Rebellion in, in late 1483, he talks about a proclamation for the reform of sexual morals. Highly unusual. Never had been done before. And he really sort of castigates not Henry Tudor and the, rebel, the rebels over in, in Buckingham as, as having loose morals, being involved in adultery. And that's completely different from his brother Edward IV, who himself was an adulterer and uh, you know, enjoyed the company of women. So he's, he's a, a complex character, which I think obviously why so many people are interested in him. But on most things, he follows the norm of what medieval kings were expected to do. Am I not right to say, though, that Rich did have a couple of, I don't know if you call them extramarital relationships, or did he not even have a love child or two? He didn't necessarily live up to his own standards in that regard. Yeah, well, Richard, we know, had at least two illegitimate children. There was John of Gloucester, who, Richard must have had him fairly young, probably when he was either 15 or 16, um, you know, sowing his wild oats at that particular time, because that, again, was seen as the expectation of a nobleman to, before they got married to go out and uh, enjoy themselves. But... John of Gloucester is, is appointed to be captain of Calais by the time it comes to 1485, so he must be coming close to majority. Um, and then there's Catherine Plantagenet, who Richard ad admits is his illegitimate daughter, and he marries her off to William, Earl of Pembroke. We don't know th the exact dates of their birth, so we don't know whether they were born when Richard himself was married to Anne Neville around 14. 72, 1471. So that sort of early life is unusual, but it wouldn't preclude Richard having other relationships. The Ricardians have argued that obviously once he was married, he stayed true and loyal to his wife. Compared to his brother, who was absolutely profligate in terms of the number of affairs he had, you know, Richard seems to have very few illegitimate children. But then George, Duke of Clarence, his brother, had no legitimate children. So it's d difficult to quantify, but you know, certainly Richard can't be... He's, he's not sort of whiter than white. He can't claim that suddenly Anne was his first love and his only relationship. Then if we get into the debate about the prince in the tower, if a lot of historians are right and he did, he did have them killed, surely that contradicts a lot with his idea of trying to be a moral man because not killing children it must be far worse even than sexual immorality he was reigning against. The thing with the princes in the tower... You know, Edward V is proclaimed king, but Richard seems absolutely convinced that Edward V no longer has a right to, to reign, th probably through this fact that he's found out that he's illegitimate. And I do believe that Richard seems to really believe this. You know, he's taken oaths before that he will support Edward V, and then suddenly he completely transforms. Then his, the younger brother Richard is taken from sanctuary, and then they both go into the tower, and a scene playing with guns and shooting at archery and, and, and never seen again after about late July 1483, August 1483. Now, Richard's got a bit of a dilemma because they're illegitimate, so they are no longer princes. But at the same time, they possibly represent a threat by which another agency, opposition, could come and free them from the tower. I mean, this has happened with Henry VI uh, previously in the Wars of the Roses. We know what happens when, if you lock up a, a king, 
and then the other side managed to get, regain control again. He's let out of the tower, put back on the throne. And Richard's seen that before. He was present in the tower when Henry VI mysteriously dies in 1971. So he's got form. But I think with the princess, there seems to be this episode which, which a gang of 50 Londoners attempt to free the, the princes in the tower. And it's at that point, I think, that either Richard or somebody else, maybe even the Duke of Buckingham, takes the decision that it's too much of a risk to have these children um, living. But I find it remarkable that at the same time, we've got to judge everything by the morality of its age. Why does, then, Elizabeth Woodville the mother of the two princes, to come out of sanctuary in March 1484, do a deal with Richard III, where Richard says, I'll look after your other daughters. She's obviously allowed herself to get into a situation where she's, she's going to forgive, or at least have the pretense of forgiveness, for a man who, who's under his watch, two of her sons have disappeared. Now, can we ever get back into that mindset? I don't know, but it's it just it's striking that we, we have this sort of Victorian morality that the death of you know children is obviously horrific and at the time after um, Richard's death people write in the little margins in the chronicles when it talks about the disappearance the death of the innocents but we just simply don't want whether we'll ever know enough about their fates you know there's obviously various different versions about what's happened to those children but it just seems that there was no other conversation they simply didn't matter because they were legitimate. And I sort of wonder whether, you know, Richard, because he genuinely believes that, doesn't necessarily worry too much about their fates. Maybe that does tie into his issues with sexual morality. If they were illegitimate children, maybe that put them somehow beyond the pale in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. I think that there seems to be a common understanding, not just from Richard, but from court circles, from what you see in uh, proclamations and in the Acts of Parliament, that Edward the Fourth seemed to have taken things just a bit too far with his, you know, his lusts and his conviviality and his his penchant for women. That Richard was going to be this fresh start and almost swept away anything in the past that was associated with that. That he was the true inheritor of the House of York. That somehow Edward the Fourth had corrupted things, had allowed himself to be married and then married twice, committed bigamy, um, and therefore the princess simply were part of the past and Richard was the future. Although, obviously, Richard compared to Edward seems like quite a serious character, something that I did notice in the article you wrote was that he did have a fun side to his character as well, didn't he? I mean, he had parties, he, he made jokes and liked to drink. Is it, how, I mean, how far is, was that the case? Yeah, this is a really interesting side of Richard's character that hasn't really been explored enough. It's, I think we... we because we have the sort of black and white approach that I've talked about of looking at Richard as this sort of stern man obsessed with religious morals, that we forget the other side, the, the drinking, the uh, court, the, the feasting. Um, he gives presents of £100 to his brooms of his chamber. I mean, it's an enormous amount of money. Um, he gives gold and silver cups to uh, the mayor in Oldham and uh, the City of London uh, at a banquet on the 6th of January 1484, he even promises them £10,000. Now, £10,000 in the money 1484, not today's money, to repair the city walls of Southwark. Three days later, that offer's rescinded. And you have to wonder whether he may have been under certain influences at the time when he made that offer. But these small little accounts before and after he becomes king, you know, he's interested in jewellery, emeralds and diamonds, and... A visitor to his court, Nicholas von Popelau, gives a fantastic account of actually going to stay with Richard when he's up and staying in Pontefract Castle in, in May 1484. And Popelau des describes how he goes into the king's tent and sees the king's bed all sort of resplendent with jewels and, and rich fabrics and sits next to the king and has conversations and Richard tells jokes and you know, actually this is a man who is not the man of legend. Is, you know, he's not the sort of nervous character he, he that Popolau gets on very well with him and Richard gives him a, a present of a dead pig boar and um, is very offended when Popolau tries to turn down an offer of a golden chain um, says that it will affect his, his own honor and I think with that you can see the, the real Richard coming through 
this is a Richard who tells von Papelau when they start talking about wars abroad and uh, crusades against the Turks that he himself wished he could have his country next to the Ottoman Empire so that he himself could begin a crusade against the Turks and kill them. And we know from his books also, he, he makes little underlinings in, in, in various books of his that gives this sort of picture of, of a man who is obsessed with war, obsessed with conquest, obsessed with battle. Obviously there's a huge, still ongoing debate about where Richard's remains should be buried. I mean, at the moment it looks like it's going to be Leicester. Did you in your research come across any thoughts from Richard about this or any information related to it? One of the interesting letters, the most interesting letters I've found so far, actually comes from Dutch of Lancaster um, records. And there's a letter that Richard had written quite close to his wife's death in March uh, 1485, where he writes the Duchy of Lancaster asking for um, 100 priests to be paid. He'd actually set this up in September 1484, um, where he'd asked for this foundation to be set up in, near to York Minster. We didn't really know much about the sort of details of why Richard had done this, and there's a, there's a letter that survives um, in the sort of manuscript references, DL 42 slash 20, folio 67 AR, uh, for anyone who's interested. And it says that he, he wants the priest to be paid as soon as possible. This is a sort of classic medieval government problem. Richard asks for something and then six months down the line they're still not being paid. But he asks for these priests to be paid. He says, because by their pray prayers we hope to be made more acceptable to God and his saints. So, you know, it doesn't prove anything, but it sort of suggests that Richard clearly had the salvation of his soul in, in mind when he was thinking of setting up this foundation. I mean, a foundation of a hundred priests is huge. And at the time, there is a trend for medieval kings to set up their own foundations. So even in the House of York, Edward IV moves his father's body, um, Richard, Duke of York. This, remember, Richard, Duke of York being Richard III's father. Richard yeah. III is not Richard, Duke of York, although a lot of people get that confused. Richard was Duke of Gloucester. But Richard, Duke of York, Richard's father, is moved to Fotheringay in Northamptonshire. There's a special ceremony, Richard's the chief mourner, and they set up this foundation. You can still go and see Richard, Duke of York's tomb there. Edward IV sets up his own foundation at St George's Chapel in Windsor. And it seems that Richard may have had... I believe, some other historians, that this intention of setting up a foundation and possibly ultimately a mausoleum for himself at York. Um, now, that doesn't, I think, detract from any of the arguments about exactly where he should be buried. If you looked, Henry VI probably wanted to be buried at Eton. It didn't happen. He, Richard III didn't show that he was moved and his body was actually buried at St George's Chapel in Windsor. But if Richard, you know, hypothetically had lived in the longer term and had managed to peaceably live out the rest of his days, then maybe he would have chosen York. But I think, you know, it's interesting to try and find these little glimpses of intentions that you can see in the manuscripts. And it's only by going back to the manuscripts that you can find this material. So having done this research, I know it's ongoing, is the Richard that you understand now, is, is he a different man to the, the Richard you started with in your head before you started researching his biography? Well, I've called the biography of the lives of Richard III because what I wanted to get across was not just those two years when he's king. There's so many different sides to Richard and the average attractor has their own views and opinions. But by going back to the original sources and you know, looking at how he behaves in different ways, a pattern does begin to emerge, I guess, of, of a man determined to... You've got to remember also that Richard's somebody who came from nowhere. He was the fourth youngest son so he didn't really count and you know by virtue of his various brothers dying he manages to make it slowly up the ranks this is somebody who decides to carve out a patrimony in the north who's extremely loyal to his friends and activists but is not ashamed to be ruthless when he needs to be ruthless i feel that in a way doing this biography i'd like to do several volumes to be honest there's only going to be one volume but it's uh, for, for a man who, who lived to he was only 33, and that's the other thing people think Richard was in his 50s when he died. Yeah, he was started very young, you know, began his career really at the age of sort of 16, and lives the trials and tribulations even before he becomes king. He's forced into exile twice, several, you know, and, uh, and fights the Battle of Barnet and um, fights the Battle of Tewkesbury, highly successful general up in the in north on the borders of Scotland somebody who is loved by the city of York, it's, it's fascinating how many different opinions of this man there are, how he can generate, even in his own day, even before 
before the events of 1483, before he becomes Richard III, he is loved and he is hated. He makes decisions that are popular and unpopular. But there's a lot of material that survives, I think, for Richard in a way that it doesn't for other kings. And that's also critical for when you, as a historian, are dealing with raw materials. Richard keeps a, a cartery of all his land acquisitions, and, and that allows you the opportunity to to really get under the skin of the king in a way that you may not be able to do other other monarchs. And as someone who's previously written about the Tudors, has it been hard to kind of disassociate yourself from the Tudor view of Richard III, which I guess informs a lot of what, how we think of him today? Yeah, I think the problem I've always had is when you're a historian, usually the methods you use is to go to the secondary sources, then go back to printed primary sources, and then go back to manuscripts. That's usually a sort of way of then drilling down into the past that I've used as a method. The problem with that for Rich the Third is obviously the printed primary sources that exist, whether you're looking at Polydor Virgil, Thomas More, All's Chronicle, are obviously written with this sort of Tudor interpretation of history. I hadn't realised really how powerful it is. But then there are sometimes frustratingly details in More or Hall that you really want to use because it sounds such a great story. But you have to say to yourself, no, even though it seems quite plain, we've got to go back to that original manuscript. And for me, it's almost turned the process around that even like with Virgil, I've gone back to his original manuscripts, it's got details in there that aren't in the printed version. So st studying Rich the Third, it's really sort of turned my understanding of historical sources on its head. I'm trying to work in the opposite direction for this particular project because you simply can't trust some of the interpretations. You can't give them equal measure. When you look at Thomas More's History of Richard III, for instance, you work out quite quickly that it's actually an allegory, that some of the things that he interprets of Richard III, eating strawberries on the Friday the 13th on the day when he executes William Lord Hastings, that's, he's taken that directly out of uh, medieval mystery plays, and that the very fact that Richard eats on a Friday, which is the fast day, is, is one of the seven deadly sins. And, and so therefore... A rigorous analysis of the sources um, is absolutely vital, but to be really careful not to be misled by Hall or Virgil. So I know your, your biography is still a work in progress, but what can readers expect from this book when it's out next year? Well, I began the book because if, if you looked at Richard's reign and the history books that are available, there's no really one big single-volume biography that covers Richard's reign. The last one was Paul Murray Kendall, published in 1955. Um, and that sort of is a great read, but it sort of stems off into the realms of fantasy and not necessarily historically accurate, and it's very pro-Richard. Then there's Charles Ross's biography in the Yale English Monarch series, 1981. But after that, if you look at all the books on Richard III, they're quite small, slim volumes, often covering a particular angle of the reign or they're written for the expressed purpose of being very pro-Ricardian, or if you took Desmond Seward's book on Richard III, very anti-Ricardian. And so I think there's a perfect opportunity to, to try and get back to an impartial view of the king using as many new sources as possible. And so that's what my sort of mission statement's been, really. Um, and I'm sort of toying with how I, you know, how to put the the book together because in a way trying to frame Richard's life very difficult so what I'm trying to do is lots of different sh stories almost like short stories that add up to a life I and mean, that stage where you get you gather all the material together and you know what you need to get down on paper you're just not quite sure of the vehicle of how you're going to tell the story but vitally it's not just about the princes and the tower it's not just about Richard an evil king it's about somebody who sees himself as being a member of the House of York and this sort of overriding desire that he's going to carry on his, his dynasty. So I hope that when, you know, when the book comes out, it will be seen as the next definitive biography of Richard III, but that'll depend on how well I'm able to write it, but we'll see, we'll see. That was Chris Skidmore. His biography is due to be published in 2015. And Chris wrote an article on the secret life of Richard III for our July issue, which is no longer in the shops, but can be purchased as a print back issue. You'll find details of how to do that on the magazine section of our website, historyextra.com. And you can also still purchase it digitally on the iPad and various other devices. Meanwhile, our August issue is currently on sale. It is a First World War special edition, with articles about many different aspects of that conflict, 
as well as on Tutankhamun, Augustus, Tudor Cleanliness and plenty more. You can pick up a copy at all good news agents and of course as a digital edition. Now it's time for the latest history news with our website editor Emma McFarnan. A Second World War air raid shelter buried for more than 70 years has been discovered at a primary school. The Anderson shelter was unearthed by a pupil taking part in an activity at Stoke Community Primary School in Medway, Kent, the Daily Mail reports. The shelter is so well preserved that the light bulb is still working. It's thought that the shelter was used during the Blitz by pupils at the school and local villagers from nearby Lower Stoke. The school now plans to restore the shelter so that it could be used for hands-on lessons about the Second World War. In other news, the building of Stonehenge has been voted the historical event that people would most like to travel back in time to witness. In a poll taken by English Heritage, 47% said they wished they had been there to see the lifting into place of the enormous stones at Stonehenge around 5,000 years ago. This was followed by the masterminding of the evacuation of British soldiers from the Dunkirk beaches during the Second World War and Roman soldiers patrolling Hadrian's Wall. Watching Victorian scientist Charles Darwin conduct experiments from his home in Kent was also a popular choice. Meanwhile, a historian has drawn attention to the chaos and destruction witnessed on the Eastern Front during the First World War. Dr. Pritt Butter argues that although the fighting that raged in the East was just as fierce as that on the Western Front, and casualties were every bit as heavy, the battles between Russia, Austria-Hungary and Germany do not hold the same recognition. In Collision of Empires, the first in a trilogy covering the entirety of the war in the East, he attempts to redress this balance. Writing for History Extra, he reveals ten things you probably didn't know about the Eastern Front in 1914. To read the article, visit historyextra.com. Thanks for that, Emma. Before our next interview, here's a reminder that tickets are currently on sale for our History Weekend Festival, which is taking place from the 16th to the 19th of October in Malmesbury, Wiltshire. We've got close to 40 speakers at the event, including the likes of Hilary Mantel, Dan Snow, Helen Castor, Tom Holland and Susanna Lipscomb. Tickets for a few of the events have now sold out, so do be sure to get yours soon to avoid disappointment. You can find out more information and purchase tickets at historyweekend.com. When we think of Tudor England, we're more likely to imagine the extravagance of the royal court or the drama of a Shakespeare play, rather than rotting vegetation, dung heaps and overflowing cesspits. But it was the latter that most ordinary Tudors would have been more familiar with. Pamela Hartshorn has been researching this aspect of Tudor life based on records held for the city of York. And our features editor, Charlotte Hodgman, caught up with her to find out more. So, Pam, how, how big of a problem was waste disposal in, in the Tudor period? Well, I think it's always a bit of a problem whenever you get a lot of people and a lot of animals living in a restricted space. Now, in York at that period, there, it's, um, it still is a walled city, actually, but most people lived within the walls, and so there are inevitably pressures there about how you get rid of all this kind of stuff, all these animals and people are producing. So, I mean, it's always a problem for, for any kind of urban settlement, I think. And one of the things that's interesting about looking at waste disposal is that any, any settlement has to deal with this problem. You can't have, it's like at the root of civilization. You can't have a civilization unless you've found a way of dealing with your rubbish. Yeah. And was your particularly bad? Not sure about that. I mean, I, I imagine the problems were much, much worse in London, where you had so many more people. I mean, York was a relatively, although it was, a, it was a, a sort of definitely a city in the Tudor period, none of them could compare to London in their sort of scale. So we hear a lot more about problems in London, where they just had so many more people living in the streets. Yeah. And how did they actually get rid of their rubbish then? Um, you know, did they have Tudor bin men, and how did it work? Well, they, they, what was interesting about that period is they didn't have really rubbish in the same way that we do because, of course, they were much better at reusing materials. So they would, they ate everything, for instance, of an animal just about. You know, you could, they'd stew a calf's ear or, um, you know, roast a pig's trotter. Uh, they used so much of, uh, the animals and so on uh, they didn't have packaging in the same way we 
do. And they would they would do a lot of sort of mending and sort of furbishing up. And if you had a, a like a a dress or a gown, you would leave that to somebody else when you died. There wasn't this kind of sense of throwing something away and buying something new. It always got sort of passed on to everybody else. And that meant that most of their waste was organic. Uh, there'd be a few bits like sort of broken pottery maybe and sort of fish bones and bones, but what they put out for people to collect would be like the sweepings from the floor. So they had rushes on the floor. Um, some scraps would probably go to the pigs and so on. The question of sort of dung, uh, like animal dung, if they had dogs or things, that, that would all be swept up. And that could be put out at, at, at the front door. And it was collected three times a week uh, right. in, in those periods, which is a lot more than we get in Europe yeah. nowadays, <laughs> to say. <laughs> but, so the scavengers would, uh, were these sort of paid officials. They would come along, they had dung carts, and they'd pick up all this stuff and take it to uh, the, the sort of middens, which were the big sort of piles of like big compost heaps, really. And they sort of all rotted down and became fertilizer, which was actually very, very useful. And so how do we know? Um, I mean, presumably have people found these middens. Um, is that how we know what people threw away? Well, archaeologists will certainly have, um, they look at, middens and disposal most of the information that we have for the Tudor period is through the records so we've got records of you know the council were constantly sort of telling people that you must take all your you know take your rubbish to the to the middens so people if, it, if it, for the days when it wasn't being collected they you know your, your servant was supposed to take it in buckets along to the midden the local the ward midden each ward had a midden and it was at an appointed place and they wanted people to put it all in the same place to keep the streets clean really so there were there were presentments for people who just sort of chucked it into the gutter or who sort of insisted on putting it outside you know mr beckwith's gates and hungate um there were kind of like sort of accustomed places that the council tried to change yes there were places that, that it was all supposed to go to and and that then became a place where people could go and get their fertilizer from as well. So it was a two-way process. Okay. And who organized and paid these rubbish collectors? Well, they were paid by what they could get for selling the dung uh, a lot of the time. So sometimes they sold it to what they called the countrymen, who were the people who lived outside York, uh, who wanted it for their fields. Uh, they, the council, when they sort of set up these, sort of said, well, there's going to be a scavenger in every ward now, um, and they can have the dung and filth for their pains, uh, and we'll also give them a bit of money, but they weren't, they weren't specific about how much money they would get, and clearly that might have been a token. They were, they were a bit tight about handing out their money, so, um, yeah, they wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't have got very much, but clearly it was enough to, what, what, they, what the big appeal was that they would be able to collect all this stuff and, and sell it on. It's a commodity. And were these people also responsible for maintaining the streets themselves, you know, litter and you know, things like that? No, no. They were uh, the, the, the people who dealt with the streets uh, was the responsibility of the householders. So if you owned a house in a street uh, like um, Collier Gate, you uh, were responsible for the bit in front of your door as far as the gutter. So a wide street might have two gutters and, and on either side of the street – and the middle bit was the responsibility of the council and the householders were responsible for the bit up to the gutter and including the gutter. So they were supposed to keep that clean and paved and well repaired so that the water would throw through the gutters. And um, you still see, in fact, uh, elderly ladies in York sort of sweeping out from their houses uh, up, to, up to, and they sweep it into the gutter. They sweep over the pavement and into the gutter. Uh, and in shops do it as well. I mean, it, I don't think they think about what they're doing, but that's a kind of classic way of keeping cleaning the front of your property and marking what's yours, really, or what you think is yours. I mean, it does all sound very organised. I mean, how how well did it actually work? Do people actually obey um, these rules? Well, what's really interesting is if you do, people think that oh, it was all disgusting, it's filthy, and and clearly there were people who didn't, but. These Wardmoot courts that I have been looking at, that are these fascinating series of records, uh, 
they show that they have a system which was discouraged, which was intended to uh, encourage compliance. So what they would say is, uh, if you know, you must pave in front of your uh, door before Michaelmas, or you must scour your gutter before Christmas, or something like that. And if you don't, you'll be fined three shillings and fourpence. And then at the next court, these courts were held twice a year. Uh, you, they would say, oh. You know, you haven't done that, so you are fined three and four pence. And what we can, because we've got a continuous series of these records, we can trace what happened. And the fact is that most of the people who were asked to clean or pave or whatever it was did it, because very few people are then presented at the following court for not having done it. So I think people, it's not really surprising that people care about the conditions in which they live. They want it to be, um, they want to live in sort of clean, tidy conditions. They want to be able to move around the streets. And, and most people did. I mean, of course, there are always examples that people pick up on. And they, so we hear about somebody, you know, uh, being fined for sort of throwing filth in the gutter. But the fact that they're fined indicates that that's not acceptable and that most people don't do it. And what about things like cesspits? And, uh, who dealt with those? Well, we don't know exactly in York, uh, but we think it's likely to have been the scavengers, uh, people who would come and, again, it's not a very nice job, but no. it's quite a, quite a lucrative one. And um, this, is, this is a kind of a commodity. It's a fertiliser. And, um, you know, people are always looking on the lookout for ways to make money. And uh, that's what people did. Yeah. And I think something that, people imagine happening in the Tudor period was obviously people tipping their chamber pots out of the window into the street. Did did that actually happen? Well, we do have it. I've got found one example of somebody doing that in, uh, in, in over a sort of hundred years of records. Well, we don't have the continuous hundred periods, but it's, you know, again, it's not really, it's frowned upon. Uh, They uh, like, who wants to have, you know, the console of a chamber pot tipped over their head? Uh, so and you're fined if you do that. So you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to take it out and put it in your cesspit. And um, I, I think it's. I mean, we in York, you see the guides at the top of the shambles, uh, which is uh, this lovely, sort of um, very medieval street, and and you can see hear them sort of saying all oh, about tipping the chamber pots out. And I always want to say, well, you know, I don't think they did do that. That's not really sort of what 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 it would have been like. And and if you did have a particularly dirty neighbour, you know, somebody who did, who did do that sort of thing, what could you do about that? Well, that's where the ward moot courts came in. And the, these were these courts held twice a year. Uh, they were run by and for the ward inhabitants. In other words, they, they were the, the householders and people who lived in the ward all got together and they appointed a jury. And that jury uh, sort of had to walk around the ward and sort of come back and report on all the problems that they found. So at that point, clearly people were sort of saying, oh, you know, John Smith, he won't, he, he never cleans his gutter or, you know, so-and-so needs to, um, is a noisy neighbor or so-and-so isn't, um, hasn't mended their pentas. So all these problems would come back and they'd get reported in the, in the court. Uh, so, but they weren't, there wasn't a kind of outside authority. These are people policing themselves, uh, which is a really interesting. Often they're presenting themselves, like people who are on the jury are held, are presented for and fined for something. Or the courts are overseen by um, aldermen. Sometimes the aldermen themselves are sort of told, you know, you haven't muzzled your dog or you, you haven't cleaned in front of the gutter. And uh, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an interesting kind of concept about this community sort of tr- regulating itself, really. Yeah, I mean, Tudor England does sound like it could have been quite a smelly place to live. Um, but would people have been aware of that, do you think? Uh, well, they, if there was an excessive smell, yes. I mean, there are complaints about sort of uh, privies and latrines that are, um, are very, very smelly, that they're, they're a nuisance to neighbours and to people... Uh, staying in inns and things uh, so clearly there was an issue of smell but I don't think um, I mean certainly we if we went back we would think ooh uh, you know this, this is a very <laughs> pretty smelly <laughs> place but you can go it's, it's a sort of social thing it's what you're used to and there are plenty of sort of societies today where you know you might go and think well these aren't the smells I'm used to there are open sewers or people are 
have sort of industries that are happening right in the middle of the sort of their towns and settlements, whereas we're used to everything being sort of sealed off and put out to the sort of outskirts of towns and things. So it's relative. It's a, it's a it, how what what what's clean and what's dirty are, are kind of are, they're relative expectations, and I think for the people who lived in 16th century York, uh, they they complained if they thought it was dirty and smelly, and they tried to do something about it. They didn't have the technology that we have, but they did um, have an expectation that it would be. Um, the streets would be clean and easy to move around and that people would behave, you know, in, in, a, in sort of acceptable ways. And have you come across any particularly interesting stories or complaints in your research? Well, I find them all interesting. There's a, I'm re- fascinated by this sort of notion of sort of noisy neighbours that, that, that comes up a lot. Uh, so uh, then they, what they, it wasn't so much people who were... Well, sometimes they were concerned about people sort of what they called scolding. So they were sort of very aggressive, loud people. Um, and it meant that the neighbours could not live quietly beside them. So they, uh, this idea that everyone should be sort of kind of quiet and, and sort of peaceable is quite an interesting one. But I, I love all the sort of, you know, the, the dung heaps and um, the, the clearly characters who appear again and again who were, always kind of in trouble with the Wardenwick courts because they, they're they not that there's always somebody who doesn't comply and so there was a there was Thomas Barker who had a a, a garden and the, the common midden seemed to be in his garden in fact and he was he was the kind of making people pay to come in and use it and they uh, and this was kind of objected to because they were supposed to have free access to it so people were looking for every kind of opportunity they had to sort of make a little bit of extra money and um, uh, and you can't help feeling that people who have these huge dung heaps outside their stables you know they're clearing out their stables they've got a big pile of horse manure and there's flies and there's a there's an account of the somebody who the lord president who was kind of representative of the queen up here was kind of it was it was he, he didn't like riding past this dung heap so this, this man was kind of fine and told to get rid of it. Whether he did or not, we never really know. <laughs> no, it sounds like some really fascinating stories you've come across then. Oh, no, it's a fun... It's a, they're actually, on the face of it, they seem kind of quite dull. They're about sort of paving, sort of getting rid of rubbish and things. But actually, they're about real people and, and how they... Everyday life, what was it like? What were the streets like? And you get a really clear sense of what the streets were were like in those days and, and the, these are kind of they're, they're ordinary people this is this is everyday life I've, I've found, i think they're they're really fascinating and i'm, I'm hoping to make them all uh but to put, to put them all on online on a website and make make them available for everybody really to look at and because i, I think i think they're really fascinating that was pamela hartshorn research associate at the center for medieval studies at the university of york You can read Pamela's feature on Tudor Waste in the August issue of BBC History magazine, which, as I mentioned earlier, is on sale now. Okay, so that's almost all for this week. As always, get in touch with your views on podcast at historyextra.com and we might well read out your message in a future episode. You can also, of course, reach us on Twitter at History Extra and on Facebook, where we're also History Extra. Recently, we were contacted on Facebook by a Canadian listener, Jennifer Rutt. Jennifer says, I was listening to your podcast interview with James Holland about D-Day, and I would just like to point out a slight error. Three countries participated in the D-Day invasion. Canada was not a dominion of Britain. It and other countries such as Australia and New Zealand gained their independence from Britain under the Statute of Westminster in 1931. Although this was just a formality, it enabled these and other nations to be distinct from Britain, including declaring war. I am Canadian and a military brat whose father was in the Canadian Armed Forces for 43 years, and the CAF has its own unique culture separately from Britain and much different from the Americans. Well, thanks for pointing that out to us, Jennifer, and as I said, please do get in touch with your messages on all these different channels. And you can also find out what we're up to on our website, historyextra.com, where we've got all manner of interesting history content, as well as every single previous episode of this podcast. Next week, we're going to be talking about the First World War as we come up to the centenary of the conflict. 
make sure to join us for that. This History Extra podcast was recorded in Bristol and produced by Jack Fletcher.